Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you I will seek you in the morning I will learn to walk in your ways And step by step you lead me And I will follow you all of my days Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you And I will seek you in the morning I will learn to walk in your ways And step by step you lead me I will follow you all of my days. I'm Eddie Hyatt. This is Revive America. Coming to you today with a very special July the 4th presentation. So stay with us. Call your friends. Let them know. Going to share some very encouraging and uh, powerful truths about this nation, where it's been, and also I believe where we are going as a nation. So, so glad that you're with us today. You know, there is a prayer I'd like for us to pray over in Psalm chapter 85, verses 6 and 7. It's the prayer that the psalmist David prayed. Would you pray it with me? Lord, will you not revive us again? And when I say us, I'm talking about you personally, me, and this nation. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. That's Psalm 85, 6 and 7. There's also another scripture I want to share with you this morning, and this is in relation to America this week celebrating its 239th birthday. And we need to go back and revisit our past to see where we have come from. That is very, very vitally important. In fact, God told Israel to do this at a very critical moment in their nation's history. And this is found in Isaiah 51 verses 1 and 2. God said to Israel, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. God is telling them that they need to go back and see where he brought them from because they had forgotten their past and where God had brought them from. And we face a similar situation in America today. And if we are to survive, we must revisit our past and see the hand of God in our beginnings as a nation. We must see the truth and recover the truth of our Christian heritage, a heritage that has been taken from us by secularists, historians, and um, it is like a, a Christian philosopher, Danish, uh, Danish Christian philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard said, Kierkegaard said, life can only be lived by looking forward, but it can only be understood by looking backward. So on this July the 4th, I'm going to take you for a look backward from the pit from which we as a people were dug to the hole from which we were hewn. And by looking back, I believe that our hearts are going to be encouraged and we're going to be inspired to lay hold of God here in the present and in the future. So this is a happy birthday America telecast today. July the 4th, 1776, and this is July the 4th, 2015. You know, America was formed by people whose parents and grandparents 
had fled religious persecution in Europe. To give you one example, Benjamin Franklin, one of the foremost founders of this nation, signer of the Declaration of Independence, signer of the, the American Constitution, Benjamin Franklin tells about his grandfather who was living in England. And, and, and they were a Christian family, but they were Protestants. And, 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 and Protestant meetings were outlawed. They were illegal. And so he tells about how his grandfather had a Bible and he had it attached open and taped to the bottom of a stool underneath the covers. And at particular times he would turn the stool upside down on his lap and open up the Bible and while one of the children stood by the door watching for any authorities, he would read the Bible to his family. If there was approaching danger, he would quickly close it up, reattach it, and take the stool and set it in the corner. The danger was real because during that era, during the reign of Mary Tudor, 288 Protestants were burned at the stake for their faith. And these were the kind of people who came to America totally committed to God, willing to leave everything in order to be able to live out their faith in freedom and liberty. There you see a painting of the pilgrims who landed at New England in 1620. A people who had experienced persecution and imprisonment in England. And they came uh, at part of an entire congregation. The rest of the congregation intended to follow them but never got the opportunity. But they came, husbands, wives, children. They came because they were totally devoted to God and they wanted to find a place where they would not be persecuted for living according to their conscience and according to the Word of God. And in the Mayflower Compact, which many believe, and I believe, is like a precursor to the American Constitution, and they stated why they had come to these shores. And they said they had come for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith. They had a missionary vision in coming to these shores. They wanted to see the advancement of the Christian faith. And these are the pilgrims landing. These are the parents and the grandparents of the people who founded this great nation. Now, America was formed after the landing of the pilgrims. It was about 150 years later. Hundred and, I guess 156 years later that America was founded. So these are third and fourth generations removed from that, those original, those first pilgrims and they continued to come after that. But we're looking at second, third, and fourth generation Americans here. Uh, uh, and, and it was out of a great spiritual awakening that began in the 1700s that this nation came forth. And there you see a painting of George Whitfield. There were many uh, instruments that God used in the Great Awakening, but, but George Whitfield no doubt was the best known and maybe the most influential. He was a evangelist from Great Britain. And in a sense, he was the first evangelist because at that time, people did not travel around. Preachers, they were assigned a parish and they were expected to stay there. But George Whitfield didn't feel to stay any place and he was continually on the go. And when he came to America, he traveled up and down the eastern seaboard preaching the gospel. And did you know the message he preached to the people? He didn't bring them some new revelation. Do you know what he told them? He told them they needed to return to the faith of their parents and grandparents. He appealed to their hearts. He appealed to that connection with their past. And he told them that they were backslidden and that they needed to return to the faith of their parents and grandparents. And there was a great shaking and a great awakening that began to come forth in America in the 1740s and 1750s and 60s and so on. And sometimes it seemed like entire towns were repenting and turning to God. Benjamin Franklin, one of our founders, said that in Philadelphia, said you can't walk through the town 
without hearing people singing, praying, and praising God coming from houses on every street. It was out of this great awakening that our nation was founded. You see, our nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles and values. Now, when the founders wrote the Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution, it does not have overtly religious statements because they knew they weren't founding a church. They weren't writing a religious creed. They were writing documents that were going to be the governing documents for a civil nation that would encompass all kinds of people. But there is no question that they based it on biblical and Christian principles. In fact, there was a 10-year study project, you see it there on the screen that was done, for the purpose of discovering where the founders got their ideas for government found in their, uh, you know, in, in, in the governing documents. And it was discovered that they quoted the Bible far more than any other book. There you see, America's founders quoted the Bible more than any other book in their writings. My friends, this nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles and values. America was founded, you see it there on the screen, was founded by people with a biblical worldview who did not trust power in the hands of an individual or a group because of the fall. You say, what does that have to do with the fall? Well, one thing that happened when Adam and Eve turned from God, declared their own independence, and decided to create their own world apart from God was that there came the misuse and abuse of power. And one thing that we learn from history in a fallen world, that fallen humanity cannot be trusted with power because there's the tendency to become oppressive and controlling and to, to, for, for those with power to put their neck, their foot on the necks of other people. And so that is why the founders divided governmental powers up into the legislative branch with two different, uh, with two different legislative branches, the, the Congress and the Senate. And then, and then there was the judicial branch and then the executive branch and other checks and balances because they knew that individuals and groups of individuals could not be trusted with power in this fallen world. Wow. Our first president... George Washington made this statement. It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Oh, my friends, I am afraid that our politicians are trying to do that today. That is why you and I must pray. That is why we must return to the faith of our founders. If, we have, if this nation has a future, we must revisit our past. Just like God said to Israel there in Isaiah, they were about to lose their present and their history. And God said, you need to go back and revisit your past. You need to look to Abraham uh, and Sarah who bore you. You need to go back and look at your mothers and fathers. And, 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 and you need to revisit their faith and their principles. And my friends, this is what must happen in America today. And that is why we are here with this telecast, Revive America. We want to show you the faith of the mothers and fathers of this nation and why we must revisit their faith and the founding principles of this nation. It is impossible, George Washington said, to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Another one of this nation's founders and a signer of the Declaration of Independence, Governor of Virginia, we all know Patrick Henry from his famous speech, give me liberty or give me death. But what, what they don't tell you in the textbooks in our public schools is that Patrick Henry was a devout Christian. And you won't find this quote either because there has been this whole agenda to eliminate the Christian influence from the founding of this nation. But Patrick Henry said this. He said, It cannot be emphasized too strongly 
are too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, <laughs> but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then somebody will say, but Eddie Hyatt, what about the, the, the First Amendment and the separation of church and state? By the way, those words are not in the Constitution, separation of church and state. What the First Amendment says is that Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion, nor hindering the free exercise thereof. Now, I will, I will say, I will admit and say the founders did want a separation of church and state, but they did not want a separation of God and state. Oh, it is so important to make this distinction. The founders, yes, they wanted a separation of church and state in that they did not want a national church like the nations of Europe. They did not want a national church that was sanctioned and upheld and authorized by the government with the power then to impose their views on the populace. They did not want that. That is what their parents and grandparents had fled Europe from. They wanted a separation of church and state. They did not want a separation of God and state. You see, the founders did not equate God with church. Many of them had left the state churches, the corrupt state, oppressive state churches of Europe. They had left church in their pursuit of God and following the Lord Jesus Christ. And they came to America to worship God freely. So they did not equate God with church. And here you see a picture of the founders who, who uh, signed the Declaration of Independence. 56 signers who signed the Declaration of Independence. And they anchored our rights in God, not in government, not in any human institution. Their parents and grandparents had experienced rights, human rights being taken and given at the whim of a king or a pope or a bishop. And they determined that they were going to fix the rights of the citizens of this new nation in a place that was out of reach. And so they anchored them in God. There at the very beginning of the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men or all people are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights such as life, liberty, <coughs> and the pursuit of happiness. This is a quote uh, that I'll go ahead and read it, and then I'm going to backtrack and, and, and comment on it. I, I believe it's from 1898. It was a case that was brought before the Supreme Court. And the su Supreme Court, af after spending months deliberating this and researching history and the past, and um, they made this statement that... Uh, concerning all of these past documents, the historical documents from this nation's foundings, this is what they are referring to. They said there is no dissonance in their declarations. There is a universal language pervading them all. Having one meaning, they affirm and reaffirm that this is a religious nation, that this is a Christian nation. And that's the United States Supreme Court. That should be 18, it's not 1980, uh, whatever, two as you see on there. It would be 1898, I believe. The, you, know, you know, it is so important that we understand the difference between the founders and their idea of a separation of church and state as opposed to a separation of God in state. It is obvious from their actions and their words that they did not want to separate God from, out of this new nation as is being attempted today successively in so many areas. 
For example, George Washington took the oath of office, the very first oath of office, the beginning of this nation, first president. He puts his hand on a Bible, not on some uh, Quran or Eastern religious text, not on some enlightenment document, but on a Bible. Why? Because it was his way of expressing that the Bible was his guide, was his source and guide for truth in his administration. And you saw the quote earlier where he said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and, and the Bible. Immediately after being sworn in, George Washington and the first Congress went to St. Paul's Cathedral where they all participated together in a worship service. The founders wanted God in all aspects of American life. What they did not want was a state church upheld and sanctioned by the government. My friends, that is what the First Amendment is all about. You know, there is so much evidence of this. And uh, in my new book that is now available, uh, you can go to Amazon and you can in, in order my new book on Benjamin Franklin in both um, uh, uh, Kindle and in hard copy. And it's there uh, and will be on my website very soon. But it's available now from, uh, from Amazon. Go over and check it out. You know... Uh, and the name of the book is The Faith and Vision of Benjamin Franklin. And it's talking about, it, it's documenting how Benjamin Franklin had a vision for a Christian America. And it, it documents how he moved from his early days, starting when he was a teenager, when he rejected his Christian Puritan beginnings and decided he was a deist, but how he then moved back later in life to his Puritan Christian origins, maybe as a result of his friendship with George Whitfield, who called the colonists back to their Christian roots. And I document in this book how Benjamin Franklin went back to his Puritan roots and their vision for a Christian America. Now, Benjamin Franklin called his ancestors dissenting Protestants. And it was these dissenting Protestants that, that separated God from church. Roman, the idea that God is equated with church is a Roman Catholic idea and to a less degree a Lutheran and an Anglican idea. You see, the major reformers such as Martin Luther in Germany Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland. Yes, they brought powerful truths that were needed for the church at that time. But one thing that they maintained that was not good was this idea of a state church, a state church that is sanctioned and upheld by the state. And in Germany, Lutheranism was sanctioned and upheld by the German princes and imposed upon the German populace. In England, Anglicanism was sanctioned and upheld by the British monarch, monarch and imposed upon the English populace. And anyone who would dare to deviate from the official church were in danger of persecution, imprisonment, and maybe even death. And so these dissenting Protestants who founded America did not equate God with church. That is why when George Whitfield came to America to preach and, uh, and, and saw great crowds and a great turnout, but probably out of jealousy, many of the pastors and ministers refused him their pulpits. He wasn't phased. He went out and began preaching in the open fields. And thousands came to hear him preach, including people like Benjamin Franklin, one of the foremost founders of this nation who became his close friend. Why? Because he did not equate God with state. Or, I'm sorry, he did not equate God with church. And so the founders wanted a separation of church and state, but they did not want a separation of God and state. They knew nothing 
of a separation of God and state. Now, George Washington served two terms. He could have served longer. He was elected unanimously. He could have served longer, but he, dis, he, he resigned and said he would not serve more than two terms. And so in his farewell address, he issued a warning to the new nation that there were two things that they needed to guard and they needed to maintain. He said the two things were religion and morality. And when the founders spoke of religion, they were speaking of Christianity. That was their religion, Christianity. Religion and morality. And he said that these two things are necessary for a happy and a stable society and people. And he warned against letting these things be taken away, religion and morality, Christian and morality, and he also warned against the supposition that morality could be maintained without Christianity. And he even went so far as to say this. He said, in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. Wow. George Washington would not, would not consider many of the people in Washington, D.C. today to be patriots because he said don't let anyone consider themselves a patriot if they would try to subvert Christianity and morality in the life of this nation. My friends, that was our first president. And the very thing he warned against has been happening. That is why it is time here on this 239th birthday of this great nation that was, was founded by people who had left all to follow Jesus and was looking for a new land where they could live out their faith in freedom. This great land that was birthed out of a great spiritual awakening by people who returned to their, the faith of their mothers and their fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers. Here on our 239th birthday, our nation is in great crisis, both without and within. The greatest crisis is a spiritual crisis. There is a great need and the answer must begin with God's people. It will not begin in Washington, D.C. It will not begin with the next election. It must begin with you and with me. As we revisit our past and we realize that the people who paid a great price that we can enjoy the freedoms that we are enjoying but are on the verge of being taken away because one of the founders said, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And so it is incumbent upon you and I as we revisit our past that we recover the faith of these people who left it all to follow Jesus and were willing to sacrifice to form a new nation based on Christian values and principles. They refused the idea of a church that would have power, a government sanctioned church that would have the power to impose its views on the populace. No, they rejected that, but they did not reject God. They wanted God in all aspects of the American life. My friends, it's time for you and I to realize who we are, to realize from whence we have come and to stand up and be the people God would have us to be in this hour. I'm Eddie Hyatt. This is Revive America. And I hope that you will join with me in praying for another great awakening.